So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have Dee Bluck. Hi Dee. Hi. So Dee, for the benefit of our leaders and risk readers and listeners, I nearly can all trip over my tongue there. Tell us a little bit about you and about the work that you do. About me, I'm I'm a marketer, very much a sales driven marketer, and I've been in marketing for over thirty years. I'm also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, which is the world's largest marketing body. Mm -hmm. So I know my theory, Mm -hmm. but I also know my practice as well, having uh, got my hands dirty on a regular basis with small businesses that I work with. Fantastic. Now, you've recently written a book, but you're also already a best-selling author. Yes. Um, But you've just recently written a book called... The 15 Essential Marketing marketing Masterclasses. Sorry, there's too many M's in there. There is, aren't there? Marketing market Masterclasses for your small business. Can you tell us a bit about, tell us a bit about the book and how it came about and kind of what's the, the main sort of idea okay. kind of behind it? I mean, how it came about was I, I didn't really plan on writing a third book. I'd written a, a second book that had been very successful. It still is now. And I have a condition called RSI in my upper body, which is quite debilitating. It's quite severe, classes of disability you wouldn't know looking at me. So the thought of writing very well, by the way. (laughs) The the thought of writing a third book was kind of far from my mind. But I was invited to Moor Hall in Cookham, which is where the Chartered Institute of Marketing are based. Yeah. And my second book had been their best-selling book. It had been a real bestseller had their book, and so. The guy, Andy Fernandez, who runs the book, she said, come on up to Moor Hall, have a chat with me. And it was, oh, what are we going to talk about? And he said, oh, the fatal words, when you are thinking about writing a third book, don't self-publish again, let me introduce you to a publisher. And in that phrase, the third book was born. And so okay. I decided to really open my arms up to a publisher, which was a new experience. They, to cut a long story short, they came to meet me at my home. I put forward an idea for the sequel to my current book, which is what this is all about. Mm-hmm. And they made me an offer and gave me complete freedom to write my third book with no restrictions on content or length. Fantastic. Now, before we get stuck into the book, I think it's, I mean, I, I always kind of think that that marketing is, is changing. So it's, it's, it's almost like changing on a daily, sort of monthly kind of basis. I mean, do you think it's changing? And if so, sort of how so? I think there are two sides to this. On the one side, no, marketing is not changing because fundamentally... Businesses have to know who do I want to reach, why, yeah. where do I find them, what are the messages I'm going to communicate to them, how am I going to communicate to them, and over what period of time to elicit a favourable response. That is still the same. So that so the bedrock of marketing remains the same. What's changing is that we've got more of new friends to play with on right. the, a marketing palette, okay. as we know with social media, with the dawn, you know, really pushing video in, in communication and two-way interaction. I think that the customer really well and truly is king because the customer's got a powerful voice nowadays. Yeah. So in that regard, marketing is changing because we're now about dialogue. If we go down social media channels, we're very much about building an enriching two-way dialogue. Right. So it's a bit like this, it's actually, I mean, I think I was getting the... Um, They'll, I was probably in danger of getting the medium wrapped up with the method. You know? Yes. So yeah. the medium is actually still the same. Yeah. But the method and all methods are kind of changing. Yes. Th- th- there's more choice, but really that the market space that I inhabit, which is with small businesses, an awful lot of them are not particularly up to speed with the traditional marketing tools, let alone the social media marketing tools. And some of the social media marketing tools are, t- are wholly inappropriate. And I see yeah. the side of it where. Businesses are like, we've got to get into Twitter, we've got to get into LinkedIn, we've got to get into Facebook. But when you analyse their, their client base and where they're hoping to target, yeah. they really are not that relevant. It's like, well, let's just focus on what you're doing now and making that better before we start adding on the shiny new, sure. you know, shoes of social media. Okay. Now, what I mean, that you, you mentioned sort of business owners, and you meant, and I always say business owners, and I think entrepreneurs and yes. just different people that run their, you know, their their own shows. They're even entrepreneurial people within large sort of larger organisations. I mean, are they needing to develop new skills these days to help them with, the, you know, with the the, the changing marketplace, the changing dynamics of the customers and you know things. I mean, and if so, what skills do you think they that they're having to learn? I think that's a great question, and the answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. They, they do have to embrace new attitudes, I would say. I think point. that yeah. within them are a lot of fundamental skill sets. They've got that from running their business or being part of an organisation where they have to hone their skill sets. But the biggest thing is a shift in attitude. And if I, say, look at the small, medium business owner, 
what I see is there's a, a need to push out of comfort zones, to push out of marketing comfort zones where they've always done something a certain way and therefore they believe that if times are tough they simply continue to do it the same way but do more of it. I think they need to take more risks. Right. I really take more calculated risks. I think they need to learn to collaborate with third party professional providers, for example, web designers, marketers, telemarketers. They have to learn to co collaborate. The notion that they can delegate a chunk of their business, their brand, their values onto their web developer and expect them to go away and weave miracles is well and truly over. It's about working in partnership. Mm -hmm. So really breathing life into their brand, making sure that they talk about their vision, their values, what their business stands for, rather than just thinking, great, we've got a web developer, let's just shove a one-page brief and let him or her get on with it. I think that they have to put marketing at the heart of their agenda. Right. It's no longer a case of tick box marketing, which is we're going through the marketing motions, we've got to do an ad, we'll get the office junior to do it. They really have to grab marketing by the horns, mm -hmm. get to understand what it means, become marketing savvy, and put it at the heart of their business. If you look at Peter Doyle, who's a great marketer, he defined it as marketing is a philosophy of business that places the customer at the center of the universe. Hallelujah. You know, and that's really what they've got to do. Is don't just focus on the transactional side, the finance side. Get marketing right into the heart of what you're doing. I think the, the, the really interesting thing you said there was about attitude. and <clears throat> I would suggest that within that attitude is having the ability or the, and the willingness, making the commitment to actually listen and not actually... Um, and get over the idea that you know some, some traditional business people and traditional entrepreneurs start from a position of we're right this is the way that we do things but actually we've got to get over that and, and understand is like actually you know what it's not about you it's about your customer yes and actually it's about delivering the best for your customer not necessarily the best for what you think is the, is the best because well, you would hope that those two things marry yes. up as it were but actually the most important person in all this is your customer and if you serve them exactly what they want to you know to meet their expectations and exceed them then I don't think you're going to go far far wrong but that's a big yes. mind shift sort of uh, shift in, in many ways I think I think that's a great point about listening because I am often called into a business it could be several million pound turnover doing okay but plateaued and when you go under the hood and really start to delve into the business owner's mindset and that of the team yeah is they have closed their minds. They've, they've got so focused on the running of the business, they've almost forgotten about the value that needs to be delivered to customers. They've forgotten about the importance of communicating, mm -hmm. enriching, relevant, yeah. meaningful you know, marketing programs to them. And they've just got to sit back, take stock. And I think, you're right, open up their mind to the concept that they can improve. They can make improvements. Mm -hmm. They can make changes. They've got to take risks as well. I think customers know that they are in demand mm -hmm. today. It's no longer the case that you, you could go out and just grab business. It was there for you for the taking. It's a very different scenario today. And I think that's probably with the rise of social media, that customers are empowered. There's more information available. There are an awful lot of providers that are vying for that one customer. So Absolutely right, they do have to listen. So diving into the book, I mean, I've been looking at all the different sort of chapters and the 15 different sort of chapters, and there's a couple that jumped out at me. And the first one was how to build your expert status. Yes. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about why you think this is important and, and does it just apply to people that are thought leaders in their, in their business areas or should it apply to businesses of all sort of sizes, shapes and colours as it were? I think that if you probably went back 10, 15 years, you could probably say that an expert was somebody that you deemed as being a person that you saw on the television, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that was held in high esteem that featured in the newspapers. I think the gift today is that if you operate with integrity, if you're genuinely willing to share your expertise for the benefit of others rather than just to make a fast book, then you can most definitely grab that space in the spotlight. The great thing about being an expert or to be considered by others to be an expert in your field is that fundamentally it compresses the decision-making process. Right. If you look at the stages that a prospect goes through before they buy into your service, you've got awareness, interest, yeah. evaluation, desire and action. By building expert status, by being seen to be somebody who willingly shares and gives in that particular sphere, no matter how narrow or how broad, it engenders trust. So people look at you, they can find out about you, they can search for you online, they can grab all the goodies that you're willing to mm. share through your enriching blogs, the conversations you're having, sure. the email responses, 
And instead of the usual process, which is I need to have loads of information, I need to speak to lots of your clients, I need to go away and think about it, the net result is usually I've read about you, I know about you, I like you, and I'd like to talk about doing business with you. Yeah. I think that it's by building expert status, it takes time because you have to add the layers. You can't just be an expert overnight. No. A combination of experience, expertise, doing it right and doing it wrong. And so, in a way... You pay the price by having to build it over a period of time, but you gain in that you become a person who is trusted and sought after. Mm -hmm. And you made a comment about should it be simply for thought leaders. I think that any small business owner, if they are willing to hone their craft, to study, to study outside of their sphere, to really commit to, to this voyage of ongoing learning improvement and subsequent sharing, that it's open to anyone because it's not that easy to attain it. A lot of people want the, the symbol of being an expert. You, we see it on the internet, don't we? The, the internet gurus, or I call some of the snake oil merchants, and it's the, you know, I'll share with you all my secrets if you part with a tidy sum of X amount per month. Yeah. I have seen that, which is quite vacuous, really. And that, to me, is not an expert. That's somebody who's found a platform upon which to broadcast. That's mm -hmm. very different from somebody who genuinely, probably like yourself, that genuinely seeks to build reputation through being a decent person and through then sharing it un unequivocally yeah. and not restricting access to it. I think that's, that's absolutely right. You said it, you mentioned a, a, a word a couple of times, uh, a number of times there, and it was the word was trust. And it's funny, when I go and speak at um, sort of different events, and there's one slide that I use really quite frequently, and um, it's just a picture of people building a people pyramid. And then there's a there's a three words on the uh, on the sign that says trust drives transactions oh that's great i like that i'll actually remember that i'll, I'll actually credit that to you that's great it's be, true just because i think it's like you know in a way that the way that i look at it is i think about it from a perspective of this this idea of rather than being transactional marketing yes. right now it's more about relationship yes. marketing and in relationship the thing that that uh, all good relationships are built on is built on trust yeah. trust and respect and so that's almost the currency that you've got to develop yes the, the credo the foundation that you've got to think about you can't you don't you can't buy trust you used to be able to buy trust yes but now you have to earn it and that's the it's the thing about earning it and it's, and it's about willing, whether or not people are willing to put the you know, if you like the hard graft and yes. the honesty and the and, and commit yourself and be open enough to actually kind of to earn people's uh, trust, but I, I think, think you're right. That, that can be that's a it's a it's a big thing, and but also the trust is relative, and expertise and expert status is relative. You could be the um, you could be a local butcher down the high street, and you're the local expert Absolutely on butchery right. sort yeah. of thing. So it's like it's all relative to the kind of the size of your market, the sphere in which you operate. It, it's interesting because. Over the last 20 years, I think I've built expert status, particularly in small business marketing. And it wasn't a conscious decision, I'm going to go out and be an expert. It was more a curiosity to learn and to mm -hmm. add, these, add these layers. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating is that I've attracted some really amazing brands like Microsoft and okay. the, Institute, the Institute of Directors, Forum of Private Business, some really nice big brands that come to me and ask if I will share content with their, their members, their, their listeners, their readers, whatever their base is. And my view is always share without selling. I think good experts are able to share because really the, the mere fact that you are considered to be an expert means that you sell. Mm -hmm. You don't have to start trying to subliminally sell in your blogs yeah. or, or the works that you put out there. It's just share great stuff almost unreservedly. I think I also say to people, and some people... Well, some people start talking about that, and they talk about, oh, but aren't you giving all your kind of like your good yes. stuff away? And I say to them, it's just like, but here's the thing, and this is my pers my perspective that I share with them. I say, look, you can give all your best sort of stuff away, and then somebody who takes all that and goes and does it themselves, they're not your customer. Absolutely right. There's yeah. the people that can that that take your expertise and actually read it, and it builds up a degree of comfort and a degree of trust with you, and then come back and go, actually, now we've seen that you, uh, you've got this expertise and, and, and be, you, we're building a trust in you, can you come and help us? Yes. Because they want that, but they want to see what's, I feel like, under the hood. They want yes, to see the, the, the track record. So, so your DIY customers, or your DIY sort of like consumers, as it were, they're not your customers. No. It's the people that consume kind of what you you know what you share what you can you know um you you, you distribute 
and then come and ask you. Those are the ones that really are your customers, because those are the ones that will, that are responding to you sharing and building and earning that sort of level of trust. I think that's a great comment you've you've made there about this worry of aren't you giving away too much? And just a funny a funny tale that's popped into my mind when you were sharing that is I I was a keynote speaker at the British Franchise Association's annual conference about six weeks ago, and my agent came to see me. He was on the front row. And when I came up, I asked him for feedback, and all he said was, oh, you give too much away, and I said, and long may that continue. Long may that continue. <laughs> and you're so right that so many people that subscribe to your blog and that come to listen to you, the vast majority, you're right, they just want to take away. And that's really what we, we should do is let them take away. But you're so right that there's a small amount of people that will want you on the basis of what you have been sharing. Fantastic. Absolutely right. So the second chapter that jumped out at me, because it's actually something that... It's very close to my heart, and the thing that, that, that in large part we focus on on, on, on the blog and also in the, the podcast series is all about um, customer service and customer yes. care. So the, the chapter on how to wire your customers with genuine customer um, care, I mean, what was really interesting for me is that this is a book ostensibly about marketing, yes. but you've included a section on customer care in a marketing yes. book. I mean, it's, there's, so... Is customer care, customer service, in your mind, now an, an absolutely foundational, intrinsic, and really important and essential part of, of, of marketing and how we develop our our reputation and grow our, our, our business? I, I think that the delivery of an absolutely impeccable, relationship-driven customer service is at the core of marketing. Because it's a narrow view of marketing if all we do is focus on the front end, which is the conversion of a prospect to yeah. a customer. And then we forget about them. So we woo them, they come on board, and it's like a revolving door. They go out the other side because we then deliver a lacklustre. Or oh, you were saying earlier about the transactional model of customer service versus the relationship, that we can't even deliver a transactional customer service anymore. It has to be very much relationship-driven. Yeah. So to me, customer service or the delivery of this fantastic customer service is crucial because, A, it builds on retention. It mm -hmm. creates more loyal customers. And, B, it leads them to then recommend you to even more so your acquisition costs go down yep. because th these new guys are coming on board as a consequence of being recommended. And I have seen, having been in marketing for 30-odd years, that when I get called in to look at a business and do some troubleshooting as to why it's not working, you will often find that there's a massive problem in their retention rate of customers. Yep. And you go under the hood again and you find that it's the customer service that's really letting them down. So they're great at converting. They've got an active sales force. They're hot on the phones. They're pounding the boards. They get somebody on board, they almost then lose the focus. It becomes a transactional relationship. And that was why I wrote the chapter on how to deliver a wow customer service because that's what we have to do. And the wow model is simply the, wow, I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. that was so nice. Wow, that was so thoughtful. You know, customers, once you sort of deliver the basics, they're not looking to marry you. They want small, meaningful touches that yeah. show you really thought, you really cared, and they weren't just a number. I, I, there's another thing that, that I'll share with you that, they, that you might like, as, and it's a quote by a, an American author called Maya Angelou. Do you know Maya Angelou? No, no. Right, so this, for me, per, uh, personally, goes up to the very, very heart of... Uh, what businesses should be trying to do when it comes to whether it's their marketing, their customer experience, or customer care, whatever. And there's a saying which it comes from her, and it goes, people will seldom remember what you did or what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Yes. It's interesting, because old, um, I like Dale, Car you know, Dale Carnegie, I love his books. Yeah. And in there, how, is it how to win friends and influence people. He yeah. says, people like you based on how you make them feel yeah. about themselves. And it's so right, isn't it? The, the intensity of the emotion that's associated with a feeling rather than a fact is much, much stronger. And it's, all, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's also related to you know, how we remember and long-term and short-term memory, left brain, yeah. right brain, sort yes. of like stuff. So I think it's, uh, I mean, that's, you know, um, I, I mean, that's fantastic. But so moving on, I just think the... Um, some of the stuff that you're talking about is just it's, you know, it's fascinating, and, and I would recommend people, well, one grab hold of the book because there's just a lot of different sort of like stuff in there which can you know, and it might not be that everybody needs to address all of the different sort of chapters, but it's like, it's there's, yeah, it's a good kick up the arse from time to time, yes. kind of like, and sometimes you might find that there's some gaps, and then you, there's it's also yes. be good to visit, revisit the, the book, but using the principles and approaches that you describe, I mean, are there some you give us some examples of some of the things that you've seen some of the businesses that you've worked with or some of the businesses that you've observed, what they've done, um, how they've used some of these principles and what sort of results 
they've been able to, to, to achieve. Is this specifically on the customer service side? Well, it could just be uh, just, just broadly. I mean, I mean it, it could be customer service. It could be it could be uh, it could be more broad than that. I've got some, yeah some good examples. I think one is one of my clients called VBS Suspension. In fact, I give this example in the book that Oliver Drinkwater, the managing director at established a very successful business selling air suspension and hydraulic levelling systems for various vehicles but he realised that in order to grow he had to recruit a nationwide network of accredited dealers that could fit and service these systems right. but then it's almost like the franchise concept you go from holding your brand closely to your chest, it's like this, this jewel that you protect and suddenly well hey it's out there and there are custodians of your brand that you're having to trust so one of the first things that we did was we developed, it might sound quite onerous, but it was a 90-point dealer process where we literally wrote down 90 things they had to comply with. We gave them a score. So it, some things were crucial. Things like credit worthiness is pretty right. important. Yeah. Premises is pretty important as well if you're selling to a motorhome owner with a £70,000 motorhome. Yeah. So we developed this huge process, but what it enabled us to do was to actually find good dealers and weed out the ones that weren't so hot. We then established a customer charter so that when the dealer was servicing the air suspension or the levelling systems, they had to service to an agreed standard. It even covered things like what they what they wear right. when they're servicing, the condition in which they leave the vehicle, how soon they must respond. So they can't just think, I'm busy, I'll respond in three days' time. So by establishing this auditing process before they come on board and establishing a customer care charter, it showed to the dealers how important we took their, the way in which they managed the VBA suspension brand, but it also delivered a kind of a consistent standard. So if you look at branding, it's clarity, consistency, and continuity that is at the heart of building mm -hmm. a successful brand. Here you've got a successful brand that could actually be sabotaged by trying to expand. Another example is that of one of my clients, they're called Ergo Mobility, and they adapt vehicles for disabled motorists okay. under the Motability Scheme in the UK. And the challenge that the MD, Ryan Walker, had was being able to stand out amongst a swirling sea of competitors, many of whom did not have his facilities. He employs a number of engineers, he's got very good premises, but to the naked eye, i.e. his target customer, which are motability salesmen in a, in a garage, he really had to stand out. So we came up with the idea of a campaign, and I called it Putting the Disabled Motorist First, and mm -hmm. we decided that... If we were to show how disabled drivers and passengers should be really put first, that we had to communicate a lot of his expertise to these salesmen. Yeah. So that when they were then talking to a driver or a passenger, disabled driver or passenger, they were more empowered because they had more knowledge about various adaptations. Mm -hmm. So it's putting the disabled motorists first. And I said to him, we've got to think big. Yeah. And thinking big means we're going to go to Ford and we're going to pitch it to them. So we went to Ford and nice. said, Ryan is an expert in his field. Uh, we want to put, do these putting the disabled motorists first seminars and we're giving you the first refusal on them. And you know what? They said yes. <laughs> so the point I was Brilliant. making earlier about stepping out of your comfort zone, taking risks, the only risk he had was perhaps a loss of face if they said no. In the event, we ran a series of seminars which were incredibly powerful, we run them at assessment centres where disabled motorists are assessed. We have the sales team sitting in this lovely room. Ryan sharing really useful information, not promoting his business at all, mm -hmm. about the latest adaptations, because a lot of his competitors do not do the same quality of adaptations. Mm -hmm. So he did a lot of training on that. And the spin-off was we then developed a training academy. And so what we do now is every month we send out what we call a training nuggets where we mail the guys who've attended plus the people that couldn't attend useful information about yeah. adaptations. Yeah, yeah. The net result is he's managed to increase his bottom line by 10% by getting dealers on board that previously did not know about him but they were kind of enchanted through this putting the disabled motorist first campaign. So our motive was not to sell, it was to raise awareness of Ryan as an expert in his field. So it goes back to what we were saying before. Absolutely. That's so that fantastic. was phenomenally successful. I think perhaps the final example to give you is that I'm working with an accountant called Perry's. They've got seven branches in the southeast. It's very hard getting people to switch from their accountant to a new accountant, and that's mm -hmm. our target audience. Yeah. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. So what we did, we developed a really good direct mail program. Direct mail is most definitely having a comeback if you've got fantastic quality data, a good targeted list. So we've bought data in the geographic areas of each Perry's branch. And I've developed a mail shot and the theme is it's time for change or is it time for change? Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of saying in a nice conversational way to the business owner, 
if at any point you're considering either comparing your current accountant with what we could offer you or you're considering switching, let's have a chat. We've added 15% to the bottom line of every branch by doing these regular direct mail shots. But most importantly, I also identified another target audience, which was startup businesses. And I found out that the guys at Perry's were spending an awful lot of time with a startup business, about two hours. So I developed a service called Get Up and Grow, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally what they are doing now. But we branded it Get Up and Grow, and it's aimed at startup businesses. Right. So the guys in the branches aren't having to do any more than what they're doing now, which is rock up to the meeting, give loads of tips away. But by branding it as a separate product, we are able to communicate directly with with, for example, introducers like bank managers that have got lots of startup businesses. Sure. So that's been very, very successful. It was almost taking what they're already doing and giving shape and form to make it a new service. But I also guess in the mind of the, the, the mind of the, the startup businesses and the, there's, there's owners is that if I think about it from their perspective, they are sometimes often, if it's the first time you've gone into business, sometimes they it's quite intimidating calling up an accountant. Absolutely. You, because you, you think, there's little old me starting yes. my business, and then you've got this big client list yes. sort of thing. And so actually articulating something which is get up and grow, which is, this is particularly, this is just for you. Absolutely. Well. So it makes them feel like there's a product or a service which is just for them, tailored just for them. Very much so. So that's, that, 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 sounds, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But if you think about marketing, really, it's about being able to communicate in a relevant charming way to each one of your different target audiences so if you try and lump everybody under one message you you may well get in fact you will still get business but by separating out your audiences and thinking what are their deep underlying needs mm -hmm. and if we're currently meeting them are we just being a bit too fluffy are we not actually focusing this into a specific product mm -hmm. that really talks to them in a language that they understand mm. and one that's enticing and attractive and we found with that service in particular I had one, it's lovely for me as a marketer when I sort of see the end result and there's one particular business owner who wrote it and said, I felt you were talking to me. I hmm. thought, hallelujah, we were. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. So, I'm just kind of conscious of time and I don't want to go through the, the whole book no. in the interview. But is there anything that you would like to add that, that on top of what we've already discussed as we just you know think about starting to wrap up the interview? Hmm. I think the thing I'd say regardless of the book, is that every single business has got to have a marketing plan. And many businesses focus on tactics. They're driven by tactics. Oh, my God, I'm a bit quiet. I better start placing adverts. I better get on the phone. I better kick the sales guys up the backside. I would actually say step back and develop a marketing plan. So that's the basics of who am I looking to communicate with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are the messages? So develop your positioning statement, which are the compelling benefits that you offer to each one of your target audiences. So develop your service ethos, document it in your positioning statement, map out every single benefit that you offer so that you haven't then just got white space staring at you when you need to create an advert or write a direct mail letter. You've got the most amazing fuel you can then channel into those communications. Know where to find your target audiences. Don't sting on cheap, poor quality data. Use a direct marketing association approved data provider. Mm -hmm. Instill in your people the importance of cherishing your brand and looking after customers. Involve your people, if you've got staff, within creating your marketing plan. Don't just do it in isolation. Mm -hmm. But really, it's fundamentally know who you want to reach, why you want to reach them, have the messages that you need to communicate with them, then identify the channels through which you should communicate with them, and then don't just focus on one-off hits. You should really be looking at having multi-pronged campaigns that take that prospect from I don't know who you are to being a fully paid-up customer, and that entails interest, evaluation, desire, and action, Fantastic. mapping campaigns. Fantastic. Now, okay, moving away from the book, because uh, you know we could spend all day on that, what's... What's D Blick's plans for 2013 and beyond, apart from world domination? <laughs> Having <obviously>. a rest. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, seriously, I've, um, so I've got RSI in my upper body and it's very painful. It's, I mean, it's quite painful now because I'm leaning on this chair. But That's not from typing, is it? It's from a combination of yeah, typing, posture, misdiagnosis. And so I think I just want to have a little bit of a break for a couple of months and then I shall come back. I say a break, that means I'll carry on with my full-time business, but I won't be writing more books. But I'm going to come back and then next year I'm going to do another big conference. I run a conference for small businesses that's sold out very quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run another one next year. 
next June. I've already sorted that out today. Fantastic. Congratulations. I'm, look, yeah, I'm just looking forward to doing I'm going to be doing some more work with various organisations like the form of private businesses and the Chartered Institute of Marketing, so I'll carry on doing my writing. But really it's about enjoying. I think I've managed to get thousands of readers from all over the world and so many contact me and I really enjoy responding to every one of them. I think just having time to be able to do that because writing has just taken over my life mm. <laughs> this last year. Fantastic. So. And finally, and I always end these interviews on this question, is there anything that you'd like to shamelessly plug? Shamelessly plug? Do you know, not really. I just think it would be nice that anybody that's listening to the interviews get in touch with me. You know, look me up on Amazon in um, amazon.com and amazon.co.uk so look at my books and and if you do get you know my latest book just write to me i'll just i love hearing from my readers so there's nothing much to shamelessly plug really it's uh, i enjoy i think i'm very much into karma and what you give out you get back and what have you so i just like hearing from people and if there are any opportunities for speaking that's great but just say hello fantastic d it's been a pleasure thank you very much thank you